Welcome. We're happy you're here with us today for church. Um, I'm Barkley Flynn, and I'm going to go through a few announcements for you. So the first announcement is that we're going to be meeting in the courtyard for Easter on April 4th. Uh, we'll be excited to see you, and then we're going to do it again on the next Sunday at 10 a.m. on April 11th. For anybody who feels comfortable to join us, we're going to follow uh, whatever the current guidelines are, and we're going to enjoy each other's time. The second announcement is in May, we're planning on doing baptisms. So if you have questions, if you're interested in finding out more, please contact the church. Also, if you have socks to donate for those in need, uh, we could use some more socks. Please visit onething.org, and that'll take you through the process. And we really appreciate how much generosity you guys have been showing. The other thing is, also in May, we're planning on opening the sanctuary uh, for in-person services. So stay tuned, we're working through the details and we'll give you more information as we have it. And last but not least, remember today, at the end of service, we're gonna take communion together. So now's your chance, ignore me for a few seconds, go get a piece of bread, a cracker, a cookie, whatever works for you, um, and some juice or, or wine or water, so that you're prepared at the end of the service. So if you will, let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, we just, we love you so much and we just, we just worship you with all of our soul, with all of our being. Lord, help us today to focus on, on the things that are important to you and not the things that are, that are, that are flying around in our own heads. Lord, give us, our message today that we can better serve you and become sharper and more attuned to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Good morning, FBC. Good morning, world. Great to see you. Uh, God is great. And sometimes there's not a lot of words, but right now we're here to worship God and I have an acoustic guitar and I have all of you with me and I hope that you'll join me and worship God as we sing some songs together. And uh, you know, I'm gonna do something a little different as I start today. And um, I just kind of started writing a song and it's not even done yet. And um, I hope this is okay. We're gonna, I'm gonna start off with a song that I'm writing right now and maybe you can help me write it. Uh, but there's a part of the song that I'm just going to sing for you because uh, I think it's appropriate. Uh, it's called We're Standing on Holy Ground. And uh, I'm going to sing it a couple times through. And if you find yourself singing it, awesome. And if you, uh, if you find yourself worshiping God to it, great, because that's what it's for. And um, it's just a song that's coming out of me in this season. And hopefully it'll be done. And we can sing it, the whole thing, together when we see each other. But it goes like this. what it is so far. What do you think? You like that? Let's, let's, let's try that again. I might even change it a little bit as we go. But uh, the spirit of it is that we are standing right here. We're standing on holy ground. You're standing on holy ground where you are, and I am too, here in this place in the church. Because God is holy, and He's here. He's with us. We are standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground let your spirit fall let your presence fall down cause we are standing on holy ground we 
sing what we all know. Sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. We say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy. I can lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. We say, pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, 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 holy. Oh, 
glorious day ask for your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need you. Fall on us. Have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord, for not living up to our purpose sometimes, which is to glorify you in all that we do, to worship you, that we do. In light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together love all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. And the earth you created all for love's sake became poor so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together love all together together wonderful to me and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together loved, all together worthy, all together wonderful to
every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace in streams of mercy never cease call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. The name of God's redeeming I'm going to close by this session of worship here. I'm going to close this by having you just in your own way worship God. Maybe just sing something out to him. Maybe just silently pray. Maybe to give him some gratitude. But I'm just going to give you a second to do that. To see, you can sing out. You can speak out. Um, but we can worship God without a script. So let's do that right now. Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming songs above Praise his name I'm fixed upon Name of God's redeeming love Jesus went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Going a little further from them, he fell down to pray, his soul overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Being in agony, his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Three times Jesus returns to his disciples, sleeping. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, and the crowd came there with lanterns and torches and swords. Rabbi, the signal, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss, a sword, a strike? Stop. No more of this. Jesus heals the man's ear. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. The Roman cohort, the commander, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And all the disciples deserted him and fled. First Baptist, Pastor Dave here. Excited to be back in the book of Mark. We've been there for a couple weeks. 
third week of our sermon series leading up to Easter, which is rapidly approaching. Sermon series is entitled The Last Week, when we're concentrating on a few days of Jesus, our Lord, in Jerusalem during that last week. And today, specifically, we're going to be in Mark 14, and we're going to look at Thursday, Thursday evening, uh, specifically. Let me pray, and let's jump in and see what the Lord has for us today. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Help us learn more about him. Help us see what he did throughout his life, but specifically in the Garden of Gethsemane as he put forth for his disciples and for us, he put his deeds where his words were, all of his ministry. Help us see the heinous nature of violence and hatred. Help us see how the enemy, the devil himself, that's where he lives. And help us be people, Christians, in 2021, who will continue to Walk with Jesus on the path of peace. Help me unpack that today. In Christ's name, amen. Good to be here with you. Pastor Jerome did a wonderful job last week at showing the worship of a woman on Wednesday at a dinner table when she broke an expensive perfume, a jar full of nard, and anointed Jesus. And Jesus said, this is a wonderful thing. She has worship and serve me. She will be remembered forever. That took place on Wednesday of this last week. A couple of days before we were there a few weeks ago, on Monday, Jesus protested at the temple. He protested the corruption and the deceit and the self-righteous living of the temple elite. On Tuesday, we're not going to focus there, but just so you're caught up, on Tuesday of this last week, Jesus engages in a series of debates with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And while leaving Jerusalem that night, that Tuesday night, remember he was staying in Bethany, he gives a detailed prediction on what's going to happen to the temple and to the city of Jerusalem within two generations. As I mentioned before on Wednesday, he is anointed before his death and burial. And now it's Thursday we'll focus on. It seems that on the day of Thursday, Thursday during the day, Jesus stayed in Bethany. But we'll come to Thursday evening. This is the evening right up to the beginning of Passover. Jesus sends two disciples into the city, into Jerusalem, to make preparation for Passover. When evening comes, Jesus and the twelve, the twelve disciples, go from Bethany to Jerusalem. They go to the upper part of the city, to the upper room. I should say an upper room, but we know it as the upper room. There, in the upper room, they celebrate the Feast of Passover together. This feast, remember, was to commemorate how God liberated His people in Egypt, the Hebrew people, from captivity and slavery But during this meal, which we call the Last Supper, Jesus institutes a sacrament, the sacrament of communion, the Eucharist. You might have heard it in the announcements today, but we will be taking communion after I'm done, so be prepared. Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body, broken for you, and he takes the cup. This is the cup of my blood shed for you. That's what he does in the upper room. The book of John, the Gospel of John, actually, also records Jesus' final teaching before he is arrested. We call this the upper room discourse, John 13 through 16. This concludes with the great high priestly prayer of Jesus as he prays for his disciples and for you and me in John 17. We're told that sometime during the Last Supper, Judas leaves the upper room. Now, it's important to understand that Judas leaving that dinner would not have been suspicious to anybody. He was the treasurer. He took care of the money from the group, and it would have been common to go make further preparation for Passover or possibly offer a charitable offering during Passover time. 
So now Jesus is with the eleven, and we are told they sing a hymn in the upper room. After that, they leave and go to a place called Gethsemane. Let's read Mark 14, verses 32 through 42. The scripture today is from Mark 14, verses 32 to 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here a while and while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed, that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came to them a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus was apparently headed back home to Bethany where he was staying during the week. But we know that Jesus will never make it back to Bethany. As you are going from Jerusalem to Bethany, you must go up and through the Mount of Olives. And as we know, this is one of Jesus' favorite places to go and pray. His disciples knew this. Judas knew this. He liked to pray in a particular olive grove filled with a garden of olive trees. Here is a picture of that garden as it sits today. The Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means oil press, meaning at one time there was a press there, an oil press, to extract oil from olives. Oil press. Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. We might say, in the garden we find Jesus, the Anointed One, under pressure. Hear that. Jesus is about to enter into the furnace. He will be pressured. And this is new for Jesus. We are not used to seeing Jesus out of control. We're used to seeing Him in control of everything. He's been in control of sickness and disease. He's been in control of the demons. He has in, been in control even over the wind and the waves. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He turns tables and He calms storms. That's how we're used to seeing Jesus. But in Gethsemane, things are different. We meet Jesus under pressure. Gethsemane, the oil press, Messiah under pressure. That's where we are at. To say it another way, in Gethsemane, we see Jesus, as Paul would write about him, as the second Adam. Not many of us ever think, at least I'll speak for us, I'll speak for myself, I never don't think Jesus isn't fully God. That's just, I worship Him. I worship God. Jesus is God. That's part of our foundational theology. But often I forget that Jesus wasn't fully human either. And if we don't understand both, we can slip into a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. Jesus is and was fully God and is and was fully human. He is both. And it's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the oil press, that's where we see Jesus' humanity the most clearly seen in the Scriptures. Jesus in a dark olive grove with shadows all around. 
As the eleven enter the garden, we are told, Jesus begins to change. His mood begins to change. He is clearly distressed. He is sorrowful. He is upset. He has eleven with him. He says to eight of them at the entrance, stay here at the entrance and pray. Then Jesus moves deeper into the garden with three, Peter, James, and John, the closest to him. And he says to them, stay here and pray. Then Jesus moves deeper into the center of the garden and he is all alone. And when he reaches the heart of the garden, the scriptures tell us he falls to the ground. In Gethsemane, we are told Jesus is distressed. He was troubled. He was overwhelmed. He was full of sorrow. And he felt as if he was going to die right there. He felt the weight of his mission and it felt it might kill him right there in that garden. That's what the Scriptures say. That's what Mark literally says. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so distressed and so full of sorrow and so full of confusion perhaps that you thought that moment was going to kill you So the obvious question for any of us who are listening to the Scriptures, why is Jesus so distressed? Why is Jesus so upset? Now in my 20s, I thought I could explain this all away with a couple of verses and a couple of theological positions, which are all true. But now, hopefully in wisdom, I can try and explain what's going on with verses and with theological accuracy, but I'm going to leave for room for the possibility that I or we may never fully understand what happened in this garden. And it again, is, it is one of those sacred mysteries. Here's one thought of mine, though. In our world of modernity, and Netflix, and big Hollywood, and movies, and stories which we all love, my mind usually immediately uh, shifts towards a movie like The Passion of the Christ, or a passion play. Some churches put those on those time of year. But the truth is, Jesus is not an actor in a movie or a play. There is no script. I don't believe there's no great understanding, though God, I'll say it this way, In Jesus' humanity, does he wonder at all what's going on? He believes in his Father's plan, but in his humanity, in this moment, we can speculate, this is speculation, does he know what's about to happen? I would say yes and no. Say it this way, I don't think Jesus is working from memory in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think his humanity is on full display and he is agonizing over what's next. Remember, Jesus was somewhere between a year and a half and three years into his ministry. From a human perspective, if it all ends now, this looks like an utter failure. Is this part of what's going on? I don't know, but as we read the text this time of year, as we reread these stories, we begin to ask questions and ponder. We begin to see different insights. Many artists throughout the ages, just go ahead and Google it, Jesus in the Garden, have painted this picture as a serene portrait, Jesus laying over a rock with a yellow halo around him. That's not what's happening in this garden. Jesus asked the Father, as we heard, take this cup from me. I can't do it. I'm undone. This is overwhelming. But then in verse 36 in Mark 14, he adds this, not my will, Father, but yours. Christ is fully revealing who he is, his nature, fully God and fully man. 
Jesus is no doubt feeling the gravity of the weight of the sin and the shame of the world. Jesus is beginning to feel that He is the one true scapegoat for all mankind who will believe. He is the Lamb of God who will be slain for the sins of His people. This is becoming ever apparent to Him. This is all true. And this is the reality of Him being fully God, understanding that He will make payment for the sins of His people. But there's another part to his suffering, I believe, interpretation here. There's another weight mounting past the pain, past the wrath to be born, the justice to be served, even past the torture of crucifixion, which he would have been familiar with. Jesus knew about crucifixion. Jesus is alone from a human perspective at the time of his greatest need while here on earth. Jesus is praying alone in the garden. The eight left at the gate are asleep. The three closest friends he had who he asked to pray are asleep. They cannot bear this burden any longer. These 11 men, sinful, mean well. They have come to the end of their capabilities and Jesus is utterly alone. Remember that. Many of us and many of you have suffered over the last 12 months. And one of the unfortunate things of which, in my opinion, we've tried to control the virus, we have left far too many people alone. And we must repent of that if we're responsible for that. And we must see one of the things we must learn out of the lockdowns and the shutdowns of a global pandemic is that isolation and loneliness is suffering. Those are big problems and the people in charge of us are trying to do the best they can. But we can resonate with Jesus, many of us. And if you felt alone over the last 12 years, over the entirety of your life, Jesus can sympathize with you. He is utterly alone here. Eleven of the twelve disciples are asleep, but there's one who is awake. Judas is wide awake. Does anybody know why Judas is wide awake? Maybe mention it in the comments. There's much speculation. Have you ever asked, Why did Judas do this? Why did Judas betray his Lord, his rabbi, his master, the one whom he's seen enact the kingdom of God with miracles and with authority? Why would he sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? We know from two weeks ago and even from last week, Pastor Jerome, we know the chief priests want to arrest and execute Jesus. We know that. But Jesus teaching mostly in the temple throughout the days, the daytime in the week, has crowds, and the crowds are amazed, and they say things like, we've never heard anybody teach like this. And the chief priests and the elite know if they try and arrest Jesus during the day, there will be a riot. And what happens to Jewish people if there's a riot? The Roman, Emp- the Roman Empire, the Roman guard come and kill the riot, literally. So the leaders don't want that to happen because they will most likely be tried and killed as well. They need to arrest, bind, and take Jesus away in private when there are no crowds. Judas, knowing this the day before, goes to them on Wednesday and says, I know you want to get rid of Jesus. I think I know where you can find him alone during this week. Judas again gets 30 pieces of silver and rejoins the tribe. Now again, Judas Iscariot, why would he do this? There is good history and good scholarship to lead us to believe that Judas, before meeting Jesus, was part of the zealots, 
a Jewish sect which hated the Romans and wanted to overthrow them with violence and guerrilla warfare. Again, I'm going to interpret or maybe even speculate, but this is where I'm going. Judas wanted a revolution. He wanted his enemies destroyed by any means. I think Judas was fed up with the peace and the love of the gospel of the kingdom. I think he was fed up with the living out of the Sermon on the Mount, and he was trying to start a revolution. Meaning, if Judas can force Jesus into a corner, he will then cause Jesus to fight and to lead the revolution because Judas knows Jesus is the Messiah. And what do Messiahs do? They kill our enemies. I believe Judas wanted Jesus to start a revolution so the Romans could get what they deserve. Judas arranges to betray Jesus the night before. He leaves the upper room Wednesday. So Thursday, we believe he leaves the upper room. He goes to Caiaphas' house, which is probably a five or eight minute walk. He then leads the temple guard, the temple police, and a small crowd to the Gethsemane. In the dark garden where Jesus is undone, we see the flicker of torches and lanterns and we hear people walking. Judas says, this will be the sign. Remember, no photos, no internet, no mass media. Not everybody knew what Jesus looked like. And he was traveling with 11 other men who all looked similar most likely. The one whom I greet with a kiss is the one you want to arrest. Again, why would Judas do that? you got to think. you got to ask questions of the text. If, if Judas just wanted to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, wouldn't he just walk in and go, there he is, arrest him. But back to this notion, interpretation, some might call it speculation, but we got to go there. I think Judas is continually trying to put Jesus in a corner. Judas wants it both ways. That's what I'm saying. Judas wants to be a disciple of Jesus and be loved by Jesus and be with Jesus when he was doing exciting things, but he wants these Romans dead. He hates them. And he wants to use Jesus in all his authority, in all his heavenly power, to kill the one he hates. I think Judas wants to manipulate Jesus into acting the way Judas thinks Jesus should act, so Jesus will be forced into a corner and forced to fight and kill his enemies. But he still wants to be a disciple of Jesus. That can happen a lot, you know. We want to follow Jesus, but we want to make Jesus the way we want him to be, and then we'll follow him. So Judas comes and says, O Master, O Rabbi, and kisses him. And then Judas goes, How did they get here, Jesus? And he wants to back away and let Jesus take on the mob and eventually the enemy, the Roman Empire. I think that's what might be happening. Jesus is betrayed by a kiss. This is heartbreaking because Jesus doesn't hate Judas. Judas has been with him. Jesus has been betrayed by a friend. The kiss is given, and the guard and the crowd step in to arrest Jesus. And what happens? Violence commences, and swords come out. Peter, one of the two disciples with a sword, strikes the servant of the high priest and cuts his ear off. 
The servant's name is Malchus. Now there is blood and a severed ear and everybody is beginning to fight. And Jesus says, Stop! Enough! Peter, put away your sword. Whoever takes the sword will die by the sword. Then Jesus heals Malchus. Apparently he picks up his ear and heals the servant of the high priest. Why is Malchus mentioned there? Why not just a servant? Again, interpretation, there's scholarship to back up this, but one thought is the Gospels were written later. 15, 20, 30 years later, uh, Jesus has ascended, the church in Jerusalem has started, and I would dare to bet that there was a person, a convert, in that early church named Malchus in Jerusalem. How could you not believe? When someone attempted to kill you and severs your ear, then the one whom you are arresting stops the violence and puts you back together. How could you not believe? Jesus stopped the violence and he healed his enemy. Think about that. He healed Malchus. We should know by now we will never kill or destroy our way to a better world. Violence and destruction does not lead to a peaceful place. It only begets more violence and destruction. If we choose to live by violence and destruction, it will consume us. That's what Jesus has taught us over and over again, and he's lived it out in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was deserted, betrayed, and left alone. I don't commit violence, Pastor. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus equates hatred to violence. Jesus equates unresolved anger to violence. Just like violence, unresolved anger and hatred will consume us and it will destroy us. Inflicting harm and pain in punishment, that's not how the kingdom of God is built. Rather, by healing harm, healing pain, that's when our witness is made the most glorious. This message is for all the disciples in the garden and all the disciples who say Christ is Lord today. Jesus stops the violence and he is arrested. He is bound and the physical suffering begins. As we close, we'll take communion in a moment. It is deeply important to remember that Jesus' arrest, conviction, and crucifixion was not at the hand of the weak, unintelligent, or criminals. Jesus was arrested by tried by and executed by the most noble and sophisticated realities of government and religion the world has ever known. What are you saying, Pastor? The government and the religion that oversaw the execution of Jesus was intelligent, sophisticated. They weren't lackeys or morons. The Roman government and the Jewish religion who arrested and executed Jesus was at the pinnacle of government and religion. That's the point. Hopefully, as we close, we can take one point. As believers, we should hold a microscope to all forms of government that are indebted to violence and the religious institutions that endorse them. I'm going to say that again because that's important. We can see it on both sides of the spectrum in our country politically as believers, we should hold under a microscope all forms of government that are indebted to violence, domination, and any religious institution that endorses that practice or those practices. The institutions that use violence and destruction to rule, even in their most noble forms, 
are capable of all manners of evil. They crucified the Son of God. Injustice can follow the evil. And this is usually done in the name of God. This is the story of the Holocaust. This is part of the story of slavery in our country when some churches endorsed it. This is the story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. These are tragic events in human history. And Christians in America and all over the globe, we will repeat this. This is our future unless we repent and rethink everything in accordance to the kingdom of Christ. And that begins with our own heart. Then it begins with our families. If we are fam, if there's believers in our families. And then First Baptist, it begins with our own church. Remember that as we push to reopen and really start a new season here. The scene in Gethsemane ends with these words. They all left and fled. It's easy to think they all left and fled because they were fearful for their lives. If they are arresting our leader, they're going to come for us. True. Go deeper. Let the Spirit come and go deeper. Peter, James, John, and the other eight left Jesus and fled. Do you think those 11 would have left Jesus if they all had swords? So did Jesus. Jesus drew a sword and began to fight and kill his enemies. Would the 11 have left him? I don't think they would have. These men aren't cowards is my point. These are tough men. And I'm not just going to say men, but there's tough people. There's tough men and women who stand and fight, especially for Jesus, but they fled. What were these men not willing to do? Why did they flee? Maybe because they were scared, perhaps. I believe these men, these 11, were not willing to renounce violence and place their trust solely in God. That's what I think is happening, at least in part. Even though Jesus had taught them for years, there's a new, there's a greater way. The kingdom is coming. This is how it's built. We are revealing it in this way. It was so deeply ingrained in these disciples the old ways of violent and hatred and domination, they couldn't imagine a new way, a way of life, a way of peace. They couldn't imagine any way except the way of the sword. We are still there as people. So they fled. Jesus is left alone to go at it alone. Jesus is walking the path of peace alone out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Being a peacemaker and walking on the path of peace can be very lonely sometimes. This is the humanity of Jesus I mentioned, the suffering. This is part of the cup mentioned to James and John, which they weren't capable of drinking. Wrath, justice, they can't take that. They're human beings, but from a human being side, they were not willing, in my opinion, to leave the sword down and walk the path of peace yet. They would be. This sermon has probably ended heavy as we approach the cross on Good Friday. We should be there. The question is, before we take communion, will you and I flee from Jesus when the old carnal ways of hatred and violence come to dominate you? Or by grace, will we walk with Jesus? Will we follow Him on the path of peace? God bless you, FBC. I'm going to close. We're going to participate in communion together. It's an app Sunday to do so. Then we'll finish with a song. And uh, we love you. We're praying for you. 
as we enter into a new season, remember God is calling us to lay down the sword, the cycle of violence and hatred and vengeance, and to follow Jesus, even if it's just him and us walking on that path of peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for a heavy scene in a heavy place where your son uh, bore the brunt of sin, where uh, he was preparing to be crucified. He's arrested. And in grace, when violence and a fight breaks out, he says, stop, put down your sword. If you live by the sword, you will indeed die by the sword. Burn that into our conscience. Holy Spirit, impress that upon our hearts. May we, by grace, overcome hatred and anger and violence in our own hearts and walk with Jesus on the path to peace all the day of our lives. Father, make this church a place of peacemakers, a place where forgiven people are looking to forgive others all the days of our life. Thank you for the institution of communion. Thank you for your son, his body, and his blood. In Christ's name, amen. Hey church, great to be with you here once again. And uh, I'm right here in, in my uh, in my little, it's not really an upper room, it's kind of a side room, um, but similar to the upper room. Great to be with you church. We're gonna do communion together and I'm gonna remind you that as we talked about last week in my sermon and then Pastor Dave today, uh, chapter 14 really it really uh, it leads right into the story of the Last Supper. Great, a great story. So what a great text for us to be on to uh, to be taking communion together. Awesome. So remember that Jesus, he was in Bethany, and then they they leave Bethany, and the the whole story about the woman, which we learned about last week, she does this radical act of worship um, in front of Jesus, and people condemn her, but then Jesus says, no, 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 this is this 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 is a great thing. This is a good thing. You should learn from this. And then the, the disciples, because it's Passover, like we talked about, it's Passover, and the disciples are, are saying, hey, where are we going to celebrate Passover? We, we have to do this. This is one of the biggest pieces of our faith and our as a people. We need to find our place to celebrate and take this meal together. So they find, they find their upper room. They find the big room. And they're up there, and Jesus now makes the Passover not just about what it is celebrating in the past and how God delivered the people of God, but now it's now a new covenant. Jesus really from that moment in that in that time in the upper room with the disciples makes it about himself. It is a very dramatic moment in really history, not just religious history, but just all of history. Jesus says, you celebrate Passover, and some of you will continue to celebrate Passover, which is great but you're also going to do this in remembrance of me because I am here to bring in the new covenant, the, the new way. What, a, what an amazing thing. So I'm gonna read this text out of Mark and then we are going to do what Jesus said. We're going to take these symbols and remember it doesn't matter what the symbols are, if, if it's juice or if it's water even, and you know, a bread or cracker, whatever, whatever it is, as long as you have something liquid and something solid to eat and drink to remember Jesus because that's, that's what he's getting at. Just do this in remembrance of me. So let's, uh, let's look at that together. This is when they're up in the upper room on Passover. And Jesus, while they're eating, they're eating their celebratory meal of the Passover. And he takes the bread, Jesus does. And he had given thanks and he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, what? Take it. This is my body, he says. Then he takes the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. This is, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Amen. That's it. And that's what we're going to do this morning, church. If you're not a follower of Christ and you're watching this, we we tell anyone that they can take communion. I always, as a pastor, personally advise people that not to take communion until you have followed Jesus, made a decision, and you fully, truly understand it. But you're still welcome to the table either way. And of course, you can talk to either Pastor Dave or myself about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to take communion and to be baptized. So let's do this. Church, 
Let's take the cracker or bread or whatever you have to eat and remember the body of Christ that was broken for each one of us. And then if you will take the cup with me, whatever you're drinking, and remember that this represents the blood of Christ which was spilled in that beautiful display, that beautiful and brutal act of love from God, Jesus in the God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, who was beaten and bruised for our iniquity, for our sin. His blood was poured out for your sin, for my sin. Let's receive that and repent as we do that. Lay those sins at the cross and then thank him for it. Let's drink together. Pray with me, church. Thank you, Lord, for you setting and paving the way for us to be able to take Holy Communion together, to be able to remember you, Jesus, and what you did. And you commanded us to do this 2,000 years ago, and here we are still doing this, remembering you, remembering your sacrifice with these symbols that we've been given. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. We, we lay our sins down at your feet. We don't have to keep getting saved over and over. That's not what we're here to do. But you do call us to remember you and your sacrifice and remember our sin and remember that we were delivered for our sin and to repent of our ongoing sin. These are all part of, they're all elements of communion. So we, we do that this morning and we thank you, Jesus. We praise you, we worship you, we surrender to you in your name. Amen. Nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. And your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord And we sing, Holy Spirit, you are well this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord and we sing Holy Spirit you are welcome to you come 
flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware.
Yeah.